This unit is on genomes and their evolution. It is meant to correspond with chapter 18 and it is for Ms. Vital's AP Biology class. Many genomes of many different species have been sequenced. The study of genomes is called genomics. Bioinformatics uses methods for storing, retrieving, and analyzing DNA, RNA, and protein sequences, including the structure and the function of these biological molecules. Completed in the year 2003, the Human Genome Project was a 13-year project that identified 20 to 25,000 human genes, determined the sequence of 3 billion base pairs, and stored the information in databases. When the Human Genome Project began, the order, number, and banding patterns of chromosomes had been determined, including the location of some genes. The project actually was being completed by two different groups. First, the NIH, the U.S. National Institute of Health, and the Department of Energy joined with international collaborators around the world. The other group, Blair Genomics, led by Craig Venter, used a different approach to sequencing the human genome. The International Consortium used a three-step process. The first step creates a linkage map using markers that identify known sequences. Next, a physical map was created by ordering fragments of chromosomes created by restriction enzymes. And finally, they determine the nucleotide sequence of each fragment. The first stage of the public human genome project focused on identifying marker sequences or unique tags shown here in yellow at regular intervals throughout this book of life. Once enough sequences were tagged, various blocks of the genome were allocated to different academic centers for sequencing. To begin the sequencing process, several copies of a section of DNA, represented here as a page of text, are cleaved to produce smaller fragments. Although it looks fairly orderly, this step is small-scale shotgun, which creates numerous random fragments. Each fragment is sequenced. Then, computer programs align the overlap between fragments to build up an entire page. Marker sequences, shown in yellow, help establish the order of pages in the Book of Life. This methodical process produced huge amounts of data that have been used to virtually reassemble our genome. However, there are gaps. Repeat sequences are common in the human genome, so repeats from entirely different chromosomes may be erroneously joined together. It will take many years to detect mismatches called repeat sequences. Some regions, especially near the centromeres, may never be fully finished. Solera Genomics used the whole genome shotgun method, which basically skips the linkage mapping and physical mapping steps of the first method. First, they copy DNA and cut it into overlapping fragments. Then the fragments are cloned. They sequence the fragments, and they use computers to put the sequences in order. This approach is widely used now. Shotgun sequencing is the method that was used by the Private Genome Project. Shotgun sequencing requires multiple copies of the genome, which are effectively blown up into millions of small fragments. Each fragment is then sequenced. The small fragments are assembled using an immense amount of computer power to match overlapping sections. The drawback of this method comes when dealing with repeat sequences. Often there is no way of knowing how long the repeat sequence is, or in which of the many different possible positions the fragments overlap. Even the incredibly powerful software used to shotgun sequence the human genome couldn't cope with this. So Celera, the private company which relied on this approach, had to use the public data to fill in the gaps left by the repeats.
The NIH, the National Institutes of Health, created the NCBI website. The National Center for Biotechnology Information is a site that has multiple resources on the human genome. Although about half of the genes were known before the Human Genome Project, figuring out the rest presented a challenge. ESTs, express sequence tags, are identified by computer software that scans stored DNA. ESTs are sequences that correspond to known messenger RNAs. Using this method, genes can be identified that were previously unknown. Scientists can then compare these new genes to known genes from other organisms to try and identify the phenotype of that gene. With this newly acquired information, we can study whole genomes and the interaction between the different genes. Since genes code for proteins, the interactions between those proteins can also be studied. This is called proteomics. The sequencing of the human genome is one of the most important scientific achievements ever. The best way to make sense of this information is to apply a systems approach to the interactions between genes and proteins. This can help us to understand the operation of tissues, organ systems, organisms, etc. By sequencing thousands of different genomes, we have learned the following. Prokaryote genomes have one to six million base pairs compared to eukaryotes. Multicellular euka eukaryotes have hundreds or thousands of millions of base pairs. Prokaryotes have up to 8,000 genes, whereas eukaryotes can have as many as 40,000 genes. The number of genes does not always translate into complexity. Humans have fewer genes than a mouse or even rice, but alternative RNA splicing greatly increases the number of proteins produced by the 20,500 genes humans possess. In addition, eukaryotes tend to have fewer genes in a given number of base pairs. This is low gene density. So even though we have thousands of times more DNA than bacteria, we only have about 15 times as many genes. And remember, bacteria have no introns. Mammals seem to have the lowest gene density. So much of our genome doesn't code for proteins or RNA. In fact, only about 1.5% of our genome codes for proteins and RNA. The rest has often be, been considered junk DNA. But as I've said before, we are realizing that this non-coding DNA does have some functions. Some of this consists of pseudogenes. This is DNA sequences similar to normal genes, but non-functional. They may be vestigial or had a purpose in ancestors. There is also repetitive DNA. These are sequences that were repeated in the genome. A lot of repetitive DNA is transposable elements and related sequences. Transposable elements are areas of DNA that move around. Transposable elements and their related sequences make up to 25 to 50 percent of mammal genome. In the 1940s, a geneticist named Barbara McClintock made a discovery that would revolutionize molecular biology, a science that didn't even exist. She was so much ahead of her time, her research didn't have an impact for 30 years. McClintock began her career in 1918 at Cornell University, where she did her undergraduate and graduate studies and then became a researcher. Geneticists at Cornell were studying corn and noticed the normal purple corn was mutating to yellow or white. Normal Indian corn is multicolored. The corn we eat has been bred to eliminate the normal purple kernels. Oddly, the mutation that turns purple to yellow or white can reverse itself. Each kernel is a separate seed created from one sperm and one egg. That's why some kernels on a cob can be one color and other kernels can be another color. No one can understand how these unstable mutations could flip back and forth. In 1941, McClintock moved her own corn research to Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory in New York. She knew a certain kind of corn had a chromosome that always broke in the same place. She called the gene that broke in half the chromosome the DS gene for disassociated. She discovered the DS gene could transpose or move around on the chromosome from generation to generation. Then she realized that the same corn plants in which DS had moved also acquired the unstable pigment mutation. If the DS gene moved into the center of the pigment gene, the mutation, which was yellow or white, occurred. 
If the DS gene moved out of the pigment gene, the color would return to purple. McClintock used the term transposon to describe genes that jump around, or jumping genes. She found other examples of transposons over time. She was the first person to realize that one gene could regulate the expression of another. When she presented her work in 1951 to a meeting of geneticists, her complex discovery was not accepted. Her colleagues assumed that the genome is a rigid, stable structure. For 30 years, most geneticists didn't even try to understand her work. In the 1970s, researchers began to discover the same thing, and only then did they begin to recognize the importance of her work. McClintock's transposons are just one example of a whole class of mobile genes, genes that move around. McClintock's ideas apply to many types of mobile genes and many types of organisms. In the 1980s, mobile genes were used to study how genomes work. When McClintock was 81 years old, she won the Nobel Prize. In eukaryotes, transposons can move from one location to another, or a copy of DNA can be made and the copy inserts itself in another location. Retrotransposons, on the other hand, are segments that encode an RNA copy, which is converted back to DNA by reverse transcriptase. The new DNA copy inserts itself into another location. Tandemly repetitive DNA can be duplicates of long stretches, 10,000 to 300,000 base pairs long. Short tandem repeats are only two to five base pairs long, but can be repeated hundreds of thousands of times. This simple sequence DNA is often found in telomeres and centromeres of chromosomes. Multi-gene families are groups of genes that encode proteins with similar sequences. They may be identical or very similar genes. An example of identical multi-gene families are genes for rRNA, which is used to make multiple ribosomes. An example of very similar multi-gene families are two different types of globins that are found in hemoglobin. In addition to mutations, duplications and rearrangements can lead to the evolution of a new species. Polyploidy, or multiple sets of chromosomes, can result in mutations in the extra set, and that can add to the organism's phenotype. Chromosomes can also fuse, merging two into one, or parts of chromosomes can migrate to others, creating new versions of chromosomes. Comparing genes in a multi-gene family can lead to understanding when genes evolve. In addition, if one copy of a gene in a multi-gene family mutates, a different protein will result with a new function. The ability to sequence genomes allows us to compare the genomes of different species. Simply put, the more genes two species share, the more closely they are related. Therefore, they share a more recent common ancestor. Comparing genomes of individuals of the same species can also show how closely they are related and give us information about their ancestry.